light touch, yeah? Because, you know, we have 30 minutes. Yes, we don't have a lot of time to... Ready to start? Hi everyone. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you to the first of our art talks for the evening um, as part of the Tate Lates devoted to the exhibition Magdalena Bakanovich. Uh, my name is Dina Ahmedeva. Um, I'm an assistant curator international art um, here and one of the co-curators of the exhibition Magdalena Bakanovich. And it's an absolute pleasure to introduce Sara Raza. <laughs> who has a fan club here? <laughs> it sounds like maybe Sara doesn't need an introduction, but I will do a brief one or as brief as I can nonetheless for those of you who might not be um, as familiar with her practice. So, Sara is an award-winning curator and writer specializing in global art and visual cultures from very much a post-colonial perspective. Formerly, she was the Guggenheim UBS MAP curator from Middle East and North Africa, or rather for the Middle East and North Africa, I can't read, um, where she curated the highly acclaimed exhibition But a Storm is Blowing from Paradise. Um, and uh, she was also curator of public programs at Tate Modern, so it's a little bit of a homecoming tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, Sara, since then, even before then, during, has had an absolutely astonishing independent practice as well that is both curatorial and writing, and this book, Punk Orientalism, uh, is the output of 15 years Plus. 17 years. 15 years plus, 17, um, of uh, an absolute wealth of knowledge, projects, collaborations with artists and thinking together. Um, I think this must be a good place to jump in. Um, so this book has been published freshly off the press. Um, Sarah, I really want to find out about, firstly, um, something that connects to the book itself, so it connects the book itself with um, the entirety of your curatorial practice, which, uh, when you look at it, um, we find actually quite disparate geographies, uh, seemingly disparate geographies that you bring together. So as the images are looping, for example, you will see an artist called Ala Yunus, um, who is um, exploring the legacy of Soviet archives in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so seemingly this disparate space has come together. And firstly, I want to ask, where do we find ourselves in your book and in your practice? Thank you. Good evening to you all. Thank you so much, Dina. Thank you to Tate Late for this uh, wonderful invitation. It feels great to be back here after 18 years, 17, 18 years. So it's a wonderful evening to be here with you all. Uh, as Dina asked me, where do these ideas come from? So the post-colonial is sort of uh, coupled with the post-Soviet. So for me, I'm very much interested in how two thirds of the world didn't look to Europe and North America to define themselves. They looked to the former Soviet Union. So there's a little bit of fleeting between something we understand as colonialism, which is sort of the uh, full entity of um, allowing for like land and uh, both a physical and a psychological sort of uh, a practice. And whereas the Soviet Union was a little bit more based on imperialism so that the uh, possessions that were part of it had some degree of autonomy. So you sort of see this fleeting between uh, two, one idea of an absolute reality and one sort of a little bit more fluid. And I'd like to sort of argue that my curatorial practice and this book in particular is sort of fleeting between those two spaces. It's not fixed as a fixed geography or a fixed concept. As the title suggests, punk and orientalism are very strange bedfellows. They're not two uh, concepts that are usually united together. Punk is really the non-conformity. Orientalism is sort of a way in which we can subvert the understanding of how the East is imagined, both uh, as a sort of social imaginary, but also as a physical sort of uh, colonial enterprise. And I wanted to subvert that and to sort of create something that was very much inherent in the punk ideology, which was DIY and bricolage. And bricolage is a study of bringing disparate ideas together, such as punk and orientalism, to create an entirely new concept. It's a little bit different from collage. So I wanted to say that. So I have to ask you about the notion of punk then, now that you've brought it in, though there are about a thousand things that I now want to ask you on the basis of what you've just said. But let's start with punk. Well, punk came about a decade prior to my birth. I was born in 1979, so it sort of formulated in the early 70s. And I happened to go to art school. I went to Goldsmiths College. I went to Royal College of Art here in London. And for me, it was really important to sort of think of the legacy of punk within my generation, and particularly the generation that came prior to me, who were the YBAs, and then later the new contemporaries. And they sort of offered us uh, a sort of alternative, oh, excuse me, the mic. Hello? Sorry, there's a mic issue. Um, yes, it's, if you can all hear me, then I can continue. But uh, thank you, Dina. Sorry about that. Uh, as I was just saying, that uh, studying at art schools such as Goldsmiths, RCA, they were sort of the birthplaces of the YBAs, and then the later the new contemporaries. They were very much the next generation of a punk-spirited group of artists. Original punk artists, a lot of them came from art schools. Leeds, London, Manchester, various universities across the United Kingdom were sort of um, creating this new cultural sort of group of artists that were very much um, interested in sort of a bricolage, if you like, in terms of their practice with music, with other forms of visual culture, not just within the frames of their fine art practice. There was very much zine making, for example, and I was very excited about this sort of new wave. And these YBA artists were sort of part of this um, multicultural decade, if you like, the tail end of the 90s. They were, had one foot in the establishment and one foot out. So it was a very interesting, again, a dual space that really drew me to thinking about punk within a more uh, 21st century context. And of course, Oh, that's very loud. Um, I think it's interesting that you're talking about punk, which has such a rootedness in Britain. Um, but I think just jumping back a little bit to geography, yeah. the places of the book um, that both the artists that you work with and speak with and who are within the book um, are working with and are from, uh, actually are very, very far removed from this geography, right? And some of those spaces, you know, one of, the, one of the spaces that you've been working with throughout your curatorial career is Central Asia, for example, which has been such a site of 
a kind of imaginary and warping um, into, into a kind of total image, right? Um, so could you talk about some of the places and spaces that we encounter in the book and how they're dealt with both by the artists and maybe by you as well, discursively? Absolutely. So in terms of geography, it was not so dissimilar what the artists were doing that I was following. They were sort of also coming of age, ironically, but behind an iron curtain at the same time as the, some of those YBA artists that I was referencing here within the UK. They were artists who were sort of uh, dissatisfied with the Soviet sort of state system. They were trying to find subversive ways to sort of move between this uh, very rigid system that was sponsored by a state it had a very sort of, universities were sort of apparatus of a very particular mode of thinking. It was rigid, it was draconian, and so forth. And what they were really trying to do was free themselves of that. So there were two parallel strands emerging, and I've worked all over Central Asia and the Caucasus. And I've always been sort of interested in how they function, setting up artist-run spaces in, for example, in Almaty, in Kazakhstan, in Bishkek, in Kyrgyzstan, in Baku, in Azerbaijan, in Yerevan, in Armenia, in various different um, cos uh, cosmopolitan sort of contexts, and how they were operating in a dual and sometimes rather a multiple way. So they were approaching, for example, a social studio setting. So the studio became a function where peer support was being uh, sort of enacted, where uh, exhibitions were being mounted, where music performance were taking place, poetry was being read. So there was sort of multi, uh, 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 sort of uh, multi uh, varied spaces that offered you know, a great deal of activity, which was sort of very fresh and very interesting for me. And sort of that really, in tandem with my education being within rooted here in the UK, I sort of made that decision very early on to look east of the EU, to look within these various different topographies, geographies, and to sort of allow artists to help me develop an art historical practice that was artist-led. And within these sort of spaces, although we understood that the Soviet Union resided behind an iron curtain, I started really going there after the fall of, of the Soviet Union. Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. I started going there from 2004, 2005 and started working in those spaces. So it was a very different moment. There was a lot of excitement, yet still a sort of understanding that you know, they were not in competition necessarily with what was happening here in the UK or, or within the US. Like We always think about punk within the frame of Euro-American centric discourse, right? They were sort of punk in their own right. They were thinking about an alternative future paradigm. They were thinking about you know, ways in which to sort of subvert ideas that were taking a backdoor approach in some cases. And it wasn't necessarily a feeling of inferiority or sort of a competition with the West. It was a very different sort of understanding and mindset. And I think to put, um, push that question further, um, I think what's really striking about the book, um, which I absolutely loved, is that artist voices run through it very, very strongly. So um, correct me if I'm wrong, but each chapter or almost every chapter has an artist interview as part of it. Um, and I really enjoyed reading those conversations in particular. Um, as I say, to push that question further, why, because I think it really points to the core of your practice and something that obviously, you know, you and I have been speaking for how many years now? Um, we share a passion um, and a commitment to this, but um, why is it important? Why is it important to spend time with these artists to look there, to really think through those um, spaces and the questions that those artists are interested in? Particularly, you know, now that we're sitting, you know, we're sitting in London, and I ask this question also because, um, you know, I'm thinking about the space of Tate and Tate Modern. For those of you who visit our displays, exhibitions, and if you don't, please do, um, you will see that Tate also has this commitment to um, what might be called an expanded geography, to really looking beyond Western Europe and North America to artistic practices, and really looking toward what. Um, what can be also dismantled, what frameworks can be dismantled by those practices outside of that framework? 
So back to the question. <laughs> That's a, that's a great question, but you know, in terms of when we think about non-Western art practice or non-Euro-American centric practice, unfortunately, many exhibitions are sort of uh, framed within a them and us dialogue. You know, particularly, or they are uh, to use um, uh, perhaps a crude word, ghettoized sometimes, and sort of to free that. What was interesting, you, your earlier comment within this question was thinking about the artists that are either repeated throughout the book. The book is very fragmented, but you, what you will notice is that artists appear at every um, different juncture. So the same artist might appear three or four times in different chapters. And there's then a long form interview with seven artists who played a very important role within my practice. I'd like to think that I don't work in a silo. I work as part of a reciprocal cultural labor with artists. We share ideas. I've been working with the same artists over almost now for two decades. And it was really important that those um, essays sort of crystallize that relationship in an in-depth way. But many of those artists maybe appear five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times throughout the whole book. And there are seven chapters, like the chapters that are looping uh, behind us. They repeat themselves. And it's not because um, I'm repeating. I'd like to think that their work uh, solely has multiple sort of ideas and that we've evolved together, which has been really important. But one of the criticisms to answer your second half of your question, when we think about global art, is that there hasn't been a lot of investment in that. So it's been perhaps an exhibition there, a book there, a sort of um, indexical sort of top of the pops kind of study. And I'm sort of against that. It's more about relationship building. And if we center artists at everything that we do, that becomes sort of a very key uh, point to then create this sort of long-term trajectory that it's not a sort of hit and run situation that you'll uh, you know, work with somebody once and then not work with them again. It's about the continuing relationship, that long-term narrative strand. And although I'm an art historian, I did go to art school, so it was really important for me that those relationships I made are maintained throughout the course of both my personal and pro uh, professional life, you know? So it's a long-form discussion, ever-evolving, because, you know, I feel that, uh, enriched by these relationships. And although there are 31 artists in this book, each and every one of them has their own independent practice. It's very much rooted in, in the practice at the end of the day. I was speaking with somebody the other day <clears throat> uh, and they said, you can study art history uh, without encountering a single living artist in the process. Um, and we both, of course, laughed about this at how, and how absurd the notion of that sounds. Um, when, on the other hand, we might encounter somebody like you for whom it's completely embedded that, you know, there's a complete openness in the way that you work to artist voices, artist practices. And I think there's another kind of openness that's really, really important to uh, ask about and draw, I think, your attention to, um, which is this idea that you can enter the book at any point, that there are seven chapters, that there are these repetitions, echoes, artists appear and reappear, but that there are seven thematic chapters and you can enter really at chapter five or seven or one or two and um, your story or the kind of encounter that you have will be as rich as if you would start from the beginning. And I wanted to ask about your decision to do that and how that relates to, or what does it relate, what does it relate to? Does it relate to punk? Uh, does it relate to your own logic? Um, does it relate to a kind of other kind of generosity that we've just spoken about? Where does that come from? That's a great question. I've always been interested in the middle space, the space where you know elements are suspended, ideas are suspended. And I designed the book intentionally as rhizomatic. It's also horizontal, it's also diagonal, it's also vertical. And I wanted to sort of subvert the idea of Western art history in doing so. It's a model, you know, many of the places, parts of the world that I look at have encountered a degree of cultures of interruptions, is what I like to refer to, which have been all kinds of things from ruptures to revolutions to uh, various political upheavals. There hasn't been a sort of smooth trajectory, a vertical trajectory, how we understand and we look at uh, Western art uh, historical canon. So for me, it was important to create a uh, reflection, a true reflection of my curatorial practice, which is also rhizomatic in that sense. Why 
you can open the book at any point. It's sort of the experimental idea of punk, being very DIY, bringing together different ideas, different social concepts to sort of mimic that in the design of the book. It was sort of essential for me to sort of uh, have that uh, visual identity also. But again, as I sort of, uh, to reiterate, is that idea of subverting a very vertical or linear idea and to create new concepts and new ideas because ideas don't really sort of come to us in a very straightforward idea, in a straightforward sort of um, line, if you like. You know, when we're thinking about art, we use our whole brain from the left side to the right side, you know, and then back, forth, sideways. So for me, it was really important to sort of encapsulate the way I think, the way I write. I don't have a very uh, a vertical or linear way of thinking. And it was important to sort of bring all of that together in terms of the visual makeup of the book. And I think the effect is, I think both visually and in terms of encountering the book through words, is a kind of cacophony, uh, a, a real choir of voices that come together um, to build this quite, I think, fragmented world, but in a good sense, one that really has the possibility of being made and remade again. Absolutely. Um, I think you mentioned interruptions. I've made a note here um, on my phone of... Um, similar words that have come up that um, I really wanted to ask you about. So one word, of course, is in the title or in the subtitle, so punk orientalism, the art of rebellion, rebellion. Um, subversion came up throughout the book. Interruption, as you said. Um, and I wanted to ask you about this idea of artistic rebellion. Because as both you and I know, um, this idea of an artist figure rebelling against an oppressive system within which they work is not as straightforward as fighting against the system. Um, it's much cleverer than that. No? Um, you know, even thinking about uh, the Abakanovich exhibition, which you might have seen, um, you know, Magdalena Abakanovich living in Poland under the socialist system, so not the Soviet one, but the socialist system, um, and under communism as well, was really clever in the way that working with textiles, she persuaded the communist government that, you know, she was doing something fairly, let's say, decorative, but then was able to travel abroad and really extraordinarily vast trajectories of where she ended up in the shows that she had um, as a result of that and then was able to make points you know really positioned herself as um, speaking on uh, much more existential broader questions so she kind of almost maybe smuggling is the word and I know that that's a word that you've encountered as well but Speaking about the artist in the book, I wondered if you could talk about maybe one or two examples of the kind of clever subversion or rebellion um, that appear there. What are some of the strategies that the artists use in the space? Absolutely. So you asked me firstly about rebellion. Obviously, there are two types of rebellion. There is, what, and I reference the two, and sometimes they coexist as well in tandem with one another. Is that there is a more poetic sort of you mentioned smuggling, a sort of a conceptual uh, way of thinking about smuggling, of slipping ideas in, which follows a sort of poetic uh, code trajectory, if you like. And the second, there's a time to be like a blunt hammer. There's a time to be screaming, there's a time to be shouting. And that is all a very important work also. But for me, I was more interested in this sort of, uh, how does one interrupt the interruption, if you like? And what are the strategies that artists employ? And, you know, there are a number of ways to sort of think through within the book. And one was obviously there is a sort of duality between the aesthetic sort of pleasure, inviting the audience in, and then to sort of slip in these ideas about smuggling and nothing illicit there, nothing sort of negative that's associated with that. It's more about sort of rethinking or mimicking certain tropes whether they are visual tropes, whether they are linguistic tropes, how does one sort of combine several things and sort of reenact that? So behind me is the work of Vashli Vakunov, and he was one of the artists who, from Uzbekistan, refused to be part of the uh, war against Afghanistan. So when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan in 1979, he would have been um, asked to be compulsory um, to be uh, enlisted. Exactly. Uh, inscripted in the army, and he refused that, so he was told to breathe quietly, which was a way to say shut up. 
And there was also this sort of very quiet way that he adopted those codes to then recreate his art. So breathe quietly becomes sit quietly and so forth, other sort of um, ideas to magnify concepts. And also other artists have been sort of thinking through a more surrealist dreamlike concept. And our dear Taos Makajeva, who has a, an alter ego called Super Taos, and she sort of uses satire. There's a lot of elements of satire. There's an artistic license in the book that allows artists to use satire in ways to critique systems. So they're sort of smuggling in. And satire is always a little bit like, you know, how shade is. Shade is also rooted in truth. The whole idea when someone throws shade on somebody, they're telling the truth, and maybe somebody doesn't want to see that side of their shadow. And that's also a sort of very important strategy in that satire becomes a tool. You know, in some cases, some artists are very much concerned with more serious sort of uh, very much dealing with spaces of post-devastation. So there's a more idea around repair and repatriation, and that's also rebellious in the way that they're encountering um, and creating and practicing. But for me, I'm really interested in the sort of uh, slippages. Those inter when interruption allows for a sort of uh, inherent embedded secondary interruption, what happens between two sentences when there's a middle sentence in between? I'm always interested in that space. And I think you so beautifully talked about um, a kind of sensation of playfulness that I get throughout this book when I encounter it. Um, I think we must be already coming towards the end of um, our time, uh, but I think there's one more important question that absolutely needs to be asked because um, you know, both in the introduction and the conclusion of the book, they very much hold these ideas together. You know, you very frankly talk about the fact that the book is very much rooted in your curatorial practice and the experiences that you've had over the last 17 years. So I wanted to ask you about the book's relationship to the wider practice. And um, I suppose, uh, well, both the both the root of where it's come from, but also where it's going. What are you thinking about at the moment? That's a great question. So in terms of the book, curatorial practice is very, it's a living practice. And particularly with those who are fortunate enough to work with living artists, to have met them, to have you know shared knowledge with them, to spend time in studios, visiting exhibitions together. It's, a, it's one of the most fulfilling and privileged positions a curator could have. So for me, it was a way to crystallize that. The, the sort of the lived experience of being a curator, having lived and worked in different uh, cultural geographies, topographies, to then bring that back within a textual form. I was also aware that books are also objects. You know, they travel, they migrate, they move in different ways. I can send them as an object itself. So it was really interesting to think about curatorial practices as very living, active uh, work that we do, this reciprocal cultural exchange, bring it into the book form and then send it back. You know, so this idea of a sender and a receiver, I was always interested in that relationship between uh, two modes of thinking or two peoples or publics, how I have sent something and then the receiver sends it back. So there's also that relationship that I'm interested in and the book helps me fulfill that because unless somebody has seen my curatorial work or has a catalog, then they're not fully aware of this. And sort of a fragmented way to sort of put that together was the book, but also the work that next generation scholars will then do to pick that up and then take it even further. So for me, that's very exciting to sort of see what students, because I teach also uh, in New York, I teach at NYU, I teach at SVA. It's important that how uh, the next generation are going to take that forward, you know, it's just as a sort of idea and to sort of see those ideas live on. And curatorial practice is not something static. It's always living. And those of us also who work with artists who are deceased, we are creating revisionist perspectives or filling gaps of knowledge and so forth. It's constantly moving, it's constantly evolving, and the work is never fully done. I mean, I've been looking at sort of colonialism, imperialism from a sort of distance. I'm more interested in looking at it, how it operates within my daily life working in New York, living, uh, also coming to London, living here, working here. I'm interested in sort of boomeranging effects, and that's what I'm looking at right now. How sort of, um, I've looked at reverberating effects, interruptions, 
period loosely defined between 1979 and 2001, when nine, so Iranian revolution, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, uh, and then of course 9-11. So the book is sandwiched between two important poles, historical moments, but at the same time, I'm interested in how those ideas keep boomeranging and coming back, because things always come back. There's a sort of karmic effect in the work that we do, and how, where does curatorial practice sit within that? That's what I'm interested in sort of exploring next. Do you have an answer yet? It's yet to be known. To be continued. Yes, thank well, you. I think that's a really beautiful point to end on. Thank you. Um, anything you want to say about the book? I look forward to you enjoying it. You know, there will be several books are in the library also. There are some on sale here. Please enjoy, and I'd love to hear from you. And I think that that's a very, very genuine invitation, right, Sarah? Because the openness is, the openness for a conversation on the basis of the book is... Well, knowledge is not something that we sort of keep to ourselves. We will have to continuously share it. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much.
One, two. One, one, one. One, 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 one. One, one. One, 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 one. One, two, two. One, two. Yeah. 
Hello. Hello everyone in the room and at home. Um, we're delighted to welcome you to the Art Chats for the Tate Lates. Um, and if you've stayed in the room from before, then welcome back. Um, for the next speaking, we're very lucky to have Martin Shaw, who's a writer and mythologist who's going to speak on art, land and shamanism. And he also happens to be the one performer who has reduced me to complete distraught tears in my entire life. So um, good luck. So my name is Martin Shaw, uh, and I can see a few familiar faces, but a, a whole bunch that I don't know yet. So I think I'll begin on this enormous subject, of which we could talk about for many days, by telling a story. A long, long time ago, there was a hunter, and it was the end of the day, and he was tired. And as he was coming back to his hut, he saw something that really threw him. He saw smoke coming from the chimney. And when he came back into the hut, he realized that someone had been in there, someone had made a meal, someone had even darned some of his clothes. And I have to tell you that this young lad, no one had ever been kind to him in that way before, never. It keeps happening. And at the end of the week, he finally decides to do what you would have done probably at the beginning, is to come home a little earlier, see what's going on. And as he comes into the hut, he realizes there's someone else in it. And it seems to be a woman. Her back is turned. She is preparing a stew. She's grinding something into it. She's singing in a language that it is hard for us to talk about anymore. 
And as he looks at her with his hunter's eye, he can't tell if this is a woman, a spirit, or a fox. She's got this river of red hair down her back. And she knows, as all women know, when they're being watched. So she turns and she says this. I will be the woman of this hut. It wasn't a question. I will be the woman of the hut. Now the young hunter knew that this had to be a very, very good idea. And he said, that would be a, a marvel beyond marvels. They relax, they have a meal together, they sit, candle is lit, and it was a beautiful evening. It was one of those evenings that we're all a little jealous of to this day. You know, it turns out that she has a, a great line in jokes, he has a great line in stories, and it moves back and forth between them very sweetly. And she does move into the hut, but there's just this one thing. I don't know how rural you are as an audience, but if you get near a fox, you will know that at certain times of the year, it gives off a very, uh, how would I put it, a regal scent, it's a strong scent. And she said, as a fox woman, the thing is, I have to have my pelt hanging off the back of the door. And he said, well, of course, why on earth would this be a problem? Let's have another glass of wine, let's listen to another story. And they fall wild in love. The months pass. It's a great thing between them. But the pelt really starts to give off that strong scent. The most important thing about the scent is that it's very, very undomestic. And one night they're sitting at the table as they do every night. And he says, Sky woman of the dawn, bright pulse of my whole understanding, blossoming branch, you are more tuneful than the fiddle. You are everything I could dream of. You are the moon fallen into a bed of wild flowers. But there's just this one thing. It's the pelt. It's just such a strong scent. Would you consider just moving the pelt outside the hut? not getting rid of it, not burning it. Let's just move it out of our immediate living space. This, you know, it's, it's a bit much. And she looks at him and she sort of cocks her head and smiles and nothing happens. Months pass and the scent gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Until one night when the hunter is in his cups he puts his hand down the table and he said, I told you once before, get rid of the fucking pelt. In the morning, she was gone. The pelt was gone. The scent was gone. And they say and say truly, to this day, the hunter stands at the doorway of the hut, lonely in his whole body for the scent of the fox woman. That's it. That's the story. It is deep. It's really deep, that tale. And the reason I wanted to tell it, it's an old Inuit story, is that it has true shamanism in it. And when something as strange as shamanism tries to arrive in the West, or the West tries to masticate it, chew on it, bring it in, it's always going to turn into something else. So you end up with a pelt, not a wild animal. But when I think about people that are attracted to the shamanic act, I always think of them as people that are singing across the snow to the fox woman. They're trying to call her back. They're trying to be in some kind of relationship with something that is eminently undomestic. So my life has had a, it had an abrupt kind of break when I was about 23. 
And I ended up in a, an area of Wales called Snowdonia. And I sat on a hill for four days and nights, and at the end of it, extraordinary things happened. Things that were so, uh, I love this word, discombobulating. So discombobulating that I simply couldn't return to the life that I had before. And so I left what was familiar. I remember I had 16 quid, and I was living in South London. I was living in an area called Broccoli. Some of you will know Broccoli. I left Broccoli. I left the video shop that I had worked in. I left all of that, and I took myself off and for four years tried to make sense of quite what had happened out on the mountain. Part of trying to make sense of what happened on the mountain was meeting one of these guys. I met something called a medicine man. Now, I want to stress the relationship I had with him was brief. It is not some kind of Carlos Castaneda apprenticeship. I was one amongst many. There's nothing special, nothing special in what I'm saying. But it was a man called Wallace Black Elk. Uh, and for those of you that are interested in such things, Wallace's granddad was a man called Nicholas Black Elk, who wrote Black Elk Speaks, which is the definitive visionary text of the Lakota Sioux. So that's a place to go if you're interested. But Wallace actually was over here on a kind of lecture tour. Now, as a lecturer speaking in a second language, I found it hard to hold on to. But as what you call a ceremony man, he was something actually called a Yuweepi man, when he did ritual, that was an entirely different game. He could take all normal conceptions of time and space and just sort of crumple them in front of you. And he had an enormously big heart. One day, we were going to do something called a sweat lodge. And to do the lodge, you have to have really hot rocks that you put in the middle of the lodge. And we were in Wales, and it looked like it was going to rain. And I was concerned that the rain would turn, you know, would extinguish the heat of the rocks. And I said, Grandpa, what do we do? And Wallace did this. Get this. He aimed his pipe at the clouds and he prayed at the clouds in such a beautiful manner. To me, watching him do it, it was as if he was being reunited with someone he had loved an enormously long time ago. It was the tenderest thing I'd ever seen. I mean, who knew that you could court a weather pattern? If you remember nothing else from the next half an hour, hold on to that, because it's, it, suddenly the world is relatable and magic and electric and deeper than anything you ever could have imagined. Then he turns to me and says, you do something similar, be a praise maker. Now the trouble was, when I was you know, in my 20s, words in my mouth, my mouth was like a prison cell where words went to die. You know, I, I really didn't have, I didn't have, that, what's that word, uh, panache? I didn't have the chutzpah to do what this old ceremony man was telling me to do. But afterwards he said, look, the world, and I'm paraphrasing a bit, the world seeks to be admired by you. The world seeks to be admired by you. This is an old philosophical thought as well. So whatever you do, as you make your way through life, praise it, notice it. Be specific in your noticing. So actually, my experience, my first experience, and then there were many after, of meeting a medicine man was less to do with the high drama of ecstatic fight and reindeers and a lot of the stuff that comes with the indigenous or anthropological perception of it. And really, for me, the intense message was that this is a relatable universe that seeks to communicate with you. And at that point in my life, I desperately needed to hear that, which is why I proceeded from my move with Wallace Black Elk to actually live in a tent for four years and explore remaining pockets of English wilderness, which, believe it or not, there are a few left. In those days, my artistic practice, such as it was, was as a painter. Uh, and also as someone that used to love drawing charcoal on uh, pieces of paper, you know. 
Uh, and I've been lucky that to this day I, I now have a gallery, that, a terrific gallery actually, Anima Mundi in, in Cornwall. Uh, and I found a way of getting those drawings out into the world. But I trust, trust me, in the late 90s, hidden away on a mountain or a hillside actually, in my little black tent, there was no sense of franchise. There was no sense of anything you could fucking do with it. You know, you were just... The, it's interesting to remember this was a time when you could still disappear. Just before the phones and the laptops, just before our vision, think of the shamanic word of vision, it wasn't aimed there. It was the periphery, the great trembling bell of associative consciousness, which is at the edge, the Kalahari Bushman edge of your consciousness. That's the, the shamanic move. And you can see why over the last few hundred years, and it really begins with Coleridge, there has been a tremendous interest in Western art and culture around the notion of a medicine person, what that could be. Now, I have to say, we did have terms already for the visionary area that it's referring to. We have the bardic schools of Wales and Scotland and Ireland. We have all of that incredible Mediterranean mythology coming up through the classical world. But I think, and you may feel differently, I think there's something about the word shaman, which comes from the old event, to be lit up. It's different to the notion of a magician. I always think of Yeats when I think of magicians. Yeats wants to be remembered. A shaman is happy to become dust. That's a big Aikido move right there. So that's a little bit about how I came towards it. It's one of the stories, that story of the fox woman. And I now have a school, believe it or not, that's almost 20 years old. If you like the scent of this kind of thing, I have a school that is dedicated to pursuing the fox woman and seeing if we can actually quarter back into some kind of conversation. I'll say uh, one more thing. About three years ago, I decided that my, uh, I couldn't really call it a shamanic practice, but it's circling around it. After these years living in the tent, I decided to take myself into a Dartmoor forest for 101 days. 101 days I went. I wasn't fasting the whole time. I was just sitting in a place being quiet, and most importantly, I wasn't on the take. I wasn't on the take. I wasn't there to have my spiritual life pepped up. I wasn't there to learn some interesting insight about myself. I was there actually to tell 101 stories back to the place. And that became, Q. <laughs> Ooh, this book, Bard Skull, which has just come out. Can I read from it? This will be the first time I've ever done it. Okay. See if I can, and then we'll see if there's any questions. So this was the thought I had. It was the thought of all of us coming out of lockdown. And one thing I realized as an oral storyteller is that when I tried to tell certain folk tales again after a two-year break, they didn't want to be told. So my question to you in your own life is what stories are you done with? What narratives have just got too tedious to repeat? Uh, and my thought would be, rather than like these alchem alchemical cauldrons we've been bubbling for two years, we could make something more interesting or adventurous out of our lives. So in this, I was looking down in an imaginary magical kind of way at the place I grew up, which is called Torquay. And I'm with a hare, by the way. If we, okay, when everything blows up, whatever's just about left gets another petition at a good story. So if we're going to freshen this world up, we need a gabble of stories to do it. Let the strangeness of Dartmoor speak up to the strangeness of other worlds back and forth. So from, uh, from the ripped up seafront, and our ripped up schedules and our ripped up souls come stories. These stories you will hear through the high winds of my rant are to steady us. They are a back and forth between the very far away and the awfully close. That's a dangerous thing to do in these times. It can be misunderstood. 
It is a wild seeking of echolocation I'm after, a banging up against a warm body in this time of chilly distance. Martin from the 70s, this is me as a kid, Martin from the 70s speaks with the voice of a Siberian woman on the back of a moon pale giant. I can't know if we are back with him 45 years ago or he with us. But sometimes you need something from very far away to tell you exactly what you stand upon. I won't read any more than that because it goes on and on and on. And I'm very pleased with it, but uh, I'll leave it for now. Okay, does anybody have a question? UK yeah. and uh, it makes me think about witches yeah. and about what happened to the women practicing this kind of thing and I just yeah that was my thought I wondered how you feel that kind of has impacted the kind of practices that we might do today have you ever been down to uh, the witchcraft museum in Boscastle in Cornwall no well, that would be a place to have a look if you're interested in history, because what you're going to find there is these strange little remnants of folk magic uh, have all sorts of, right down on the ground, they have all sorts of relationship to uh, similar practices you find all around the world. Uh, so that's one thing on a, on a kind of a, on a, on a right down on the ground level historically to have a look at. Um, I kind of hinted at it a minute ago, which is there is a reluctance for me or there's, a, there's an ambivalence for me about when something like shamanism, which in its Siberian form is about ecstatic flight, when that hits a culture that is not anchored that deeply into that kind of practice and is also obsessed with the notion of rapid growth. I wonder if what we call shamanism can remain really essentially what it is in this climate. It's not that it's without value, it just becomes something else, it can't help it. Uh, so, and that's not to make anybody feel stupid or smaller in what I'm saying, but I just notice it. When you take something out of an environment, it naturally is going to transmute into something else. And so what I suppose I encourage you to do is look at like, well, what is alive for me in the word shaman? Why does it have a certain kind of power? William Blake always used to say, why is it that the word devil has so much more energy than the word God? What's going on? So I think really good, a really good artistic look is to see what in, what in the notion of the shaman is alive for me. But my, my parental caution, my parental caution as a dad, is that be careful with practices that are all about rapid psychotropic expansion. Because at some point you have to put yourself back together as well. And the cultures these things come from knew how to do that. But you can still take the ride, but if you don't have the grounding for that, uh, you are, you're heading into difficult waters. Oh, um, our vision entering the space right in front of our face. Um, and I find uh, kind of phone and iPad culture a, a frequent source of anxiety to myself. And um, I'm just wondering if you had any kind of um, advice on how to juggle the kind of uh, <laughs> the the need to uh, practical needs to live in this world um, with these devices, but also to make sure we keep our consciousness in our periphery vision. Brilliant, thank you. I'll, I'm sure this relates to all of us. I'll give two totally different responses. One very pragmatic response is you could have a bowl in your house, a glass bowl, and you can call it the bowl of restriction. And whenever people come into the house, just put the, put the phone in the bowl. 
utter some magical words about it so they're not sure if it's safe to pick the phone out of the bowl again. But if you have children, put, put, you, put, them, put, it, and put it in a very visible place where you all realize is for four hours it's taboo to take the phone out of the glass bowl. And if you have any power as a parent, you just say, I will know. <laughs> I will know. So that's a sort of humorous response. People often say to me in terms of modern technology, they say, well, you must love it because in Greek myth, Hermes, the god of the storytellers, is also the god of technology and the god of rapid communication. But here's the thing, here's the rub. Hermes only communicates soul to soul. So if the soul isn't opened, Hermes is not present. So even though it might seem this is a Hermaean age, like a lot of things out there, it is a facsimile or a photocopy or something that is kind of thinned out. So you have to know your own body. I, I'll say this and then I should probably finish. There's a beautiful quote by Camus, and, and I'm going to misquote it, but you'll get the essence. Good to say this at the Tate. Our work is nothing but moving through the strange detours of art to find those one or two images in whom's presence our heart first opened. Cezanne is downstairs. Cezanne painted the same blue-gray mountain over and over and over again because it was in that presence his heart first opened. So I think as you get older, we live in a culture addicted to growth and ambivalent about depth. But actually, usually great art is made, a bit like Leonard Cohen always says. Leonard Cohen went out with uh, Joni Mitchell, who was a phenomena. And he said, the trouble is, he said, Joni Mitchell had these great sort of artistic vineyards and mountains and rivers and deserts in her music. And he just said, I just had this tiny little allotment, this little patch of earth. But make it your allotment. Find the thing that only you can talk about. Avoid the other distractions. Dig in. Be eccentric. And remember, as the Persian poet Rumi says, be like Noah and build your boat. It makes no difference what your neighbors think of you. And on that bombshell, I think my time is up. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much.
so for sure. Such a good move. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, no, don't. Um, tell you what. Can you grab mine? Yeah. Yeah, mine? yeah, go for it. And I'll grab another one for myself. I'll be right back. Oh, so we hold back from talking about which ones influence us. That's good. Hello everyone. Hello everyone. Welcome to Tate Late's. Uh, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> it's such a lovely full room. <laughs> uh, uh, welcome to the Tate Late's for Abakanowicz. Uh We have a lovely little uh, artist talk this evening. Um, so specifically discussing the Tadeusz uh, Cantor's work with the uh, artists I have tonight, uh, Nina Watson and Sam Darunian. Um, unfortunately today, um, Liat Rosenthal, who's part of the Tate Lates team, unfortunately has fallen ill. 
which is particularly unfortunate considering that apparently this t I've heard a couple of hours ago that this talk has been planned since pre-pandemic times. Um, so she was very, very excited and insistent to want to get this up. And of course, just at the last moment, hasn't been able to come over. So I work with the Tate Lakes team. My name is Sammy um, and I'll be filling in for her tonight. Um, but yeah, let's just jump straight into it. So for tonight, of course, being about Abakanovich, uh, we've gotten our artists to basically select a piece of work from the exhibition itself and to reflect upon it. Um, so um, Sam, I'm gonna ask you first. <laughs> um, you've selected this piece to discuss. Thank you. Um, so I'm Sam Darunian, I'm um, an artist and I work with uh, immersive installations of sculptures that kind of combine figurative and uh, more sort of object object based um, stuff and often within my installations um, they're animated by sort of theatrical infrastructure like lighting and audio tracks that are playing over hidden speakers in the gallery um, and this, this is the Abakanovich work that I wanted to talk about I feel like um, there's a real theatricality which is quite kind of inherent in a lot of her work that I've seen. The way that she wanted to light them with spotlights. Um, if you go into the exhibition, there's also a room which almost looks like a black box theatre. Um, so also the way that I suppose you could even say that they're kind of mask-like. So that's why I've chosen this one. It's called Abacan Orange from 1971. And uh, I chose it because I feel like the, the way that she's kind of slipped through the fabric, um, almost for me, I look at that as a mask. Um, and it's almost like they're um, suspended at exactly the right height that you might, if it weren't for the barriers, um, actually kind of stand behind and uh, <laughs> you know look through. I think I remember discussing with some artists before about how originally some of the works were meant to be, like you were supposed to actually enter them and yeah. interact with the artworks themselves. I guess there's some, this sense of performity with them, yeah. you know, so it's too bad the barriers are up. <laughs> yeah. It's still, still really powerful, I think. Yeah, um, absolutely. But, yeah, I, I think it's just that sort of combination of this kind of abstraction um, with the suggestion of figuration and performativity that really resonates with me. Yeah, of course. Um, so, Nina, passing over to you. If you'd like okay. to introduce yourself as oh, well. Sorry. Tempted to sing my way. Um, <laughs> uh, I, well, I'm Nina. Um, I had my first puppet when I was three years old, and I'm now 64. And I still have that uh, love for them and um, completely intrigued um, by the potential of them. Um, I did a combined studies degree uh, and graduated in 84. In 1982, I was really privileged to be able to go to the Riverside Studios and see Cantor's uh, The Dead Class. And uh, when I graduated, um, I then looked to, I, I studied sculpture and theatre, which seemed the perfect mix to be a puppeteer. But I went to the Institute de la Marionette in Charleville-Mézières and I did a course with Philippe Chanty in uh, 85 and then in 1988 Thaddeus Cantor was there and um, I worked with him on his piece A Short Lesson. I then um, formed a company uh, called Ducot, and we were Manchester-based with a painter and my then partner, Rachel Field. Um, that was from, find me, where are we? 1990 to 2007. And then that all fell apart as um, the best things usually do. And I was then a Creative Research Fellowship at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama. Um, I was a sabbatical cover for Head of Puppetry there. And then um, B 
between 2015 and 2018, I was an um, affiliated research fellow. And then my life took a sudden turn because the money ran out. <laughs> yeah. So I was a cleaner at uh, Loughborough University. I cleaned PhD students' bedrooms. Talk about salt in the wounds. I don't actually have a PhD. I had a creative research fellowship, but in those seven years within academia, the whole situation changed, and to get a lectureship, I needed a PhD. So I was a cleaner, and then I saw a job for an activity coordinator in the care home. And that's where I work now. I'm a part-time activity coordinator working with adults with dementia. And I was part of the South Bank's Art by Post exhibition. And um, I was a guest artist on that. Um, the Abakanovich piece that I chose was Rope. I must admit, I just saw the exhibition this afternoon and I was completely blown away um, by her her drawings, her charcoal and the watercolours, I just thought those were amazing. Um, but I chose this because um, of Richard DeMarco. And um, he programmed this as part of the International um, Edinburgh Festival in 1972, at the same time that Cantor was presenting The Water Hen. So I just love the idea that these two artists were in Edinburgh at the same time. And DeMarco's amazing. If you can see the film about him, Rico, it's on iPlayer, it's really worthwhile. But um, he's got these fantastic stories about how he, he introduced Joseph Boys to Cantor. So I thought, oh, I wonder if he has, he's got any similar stories about Abakanovich and Cantor. So I wrote to him, but um, it was obviously the wrong question. <laughs> so then I, um, I wrote and had some correspondence with um, David Gothard, who, um, if you don't know, was the uh, director of the Riverside Studios, who showed Cantor's The Dead Class. And I asked him, and he was a bit more forthcoming, and it does sound as if there was um, animosity rather than friendship between the two artists. Yes. What I would ask as well is that, in that case, can you lay out the scene, the landscape within which Cantor was working? I mean, you mentioned the dead class there and such. You know, is there a particular kind of, you know, what, what, what sort of, for, for those of us here who, who may not be familiar with Cantor's work, uh, you know, can you set the well, scene? Well, I've got two lovely stories um, because, you know, it was born really out of uh, the Second World War. And I found this story um, in Abakanovich's own words. And the Nazis came at night in 1943 drunk. They bashed at the door. Mother rushed to open it. One would open the door to anybody. She did not make it. They began to fire. A dumb, dumb bullet tore her right elbow. It severed her arm from her shoulder, wounding her left hand. The capable, wise arm suddenly became a piece of meat, separate on the floor. I looked at it in amazement. We had to wait until the morning to go by carriage to the small town where there was a doctor. Abakanovich was 13 when this happened. And interestingly, Grotowski was 10. He too witnessed and experienced trauma caused by bloody war. Cantor was 28 in 1943. But I'd like to draw attention to Joanna Stern, who created satirical puppet performances and created masks and costumes for Krico II. He was a resistance fighter in Poland during World War II and survived execution by the Nazis, miraculously being rescued from a mass grave. Imagine that. 
So would you say that that's kind of within the landscape of Cantor's work? It's very much sort of processing that grief. Well, Cantor to... used mm. that episode in Stern's life within his work, Today is My Birthday. Mm. So those two stories, how do you create and and be you know, your artistic practice when you've had yeah. that kind of trauma. That would kind of like feed into our next question quite nicely because I mean, Cantor himself even said and that within, uh, particularly of academics and journalists, he called them parasites for creating their interpretations of his work. Kind of without wanting to offend Cantor, uh, how might you guy, guy, uh, how might you both describe? A little bit more about his work and tell us how it resonated with you. Um, Sam, feeding it back over to you. Um, so, I mean, Cantor, as I understand it, trained as a visual artist at the Academy of Fine Art in Warsaw. Um, and when he started working in the theatre, he kind of, it seems to me from what I can uh, gather, that he also worked more on scenography initially. Um, so, I mean, the, the thing that, that kind of is interesting to me and that, uh, that how I met Cantor, I guess, is, is how he works with objects. Um, and on one hand, you, he treats the actor um, almost in like an object-like way in the sense of, um, you know, the makeup that they have in his, you know, one of the sort of terms he coined as theater of the dead. Um, you know, they're sort of, you have this pasty white faces, and um, it, which almost kind of, you know, they're more corpse like objects yeah. than. Yeah. Okay. Bringing up the image, yeah. some of the images yeah. that you mentioned before, like, you know, yeah. I mean, such an arresting image about the, this puppet in particular. So, yeah, I mean, this, this has this the, realism sorry. to it. No, yeah, yeah, please go on. Sorry, just enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is, uh, this is one, what he would have called a bio object, and um, mm. this is what I was going to kind of. I was kind of going, um, and so on one hand you have this kind of the, you know these figures or these humans that are almost demoted to the status of an object um, or actors, and then you have um, you know objects that take on this kind of uncanny um, life of their own, and the bio objects are I think follow that logic um, in the sense that you know you have this entanglement of the, the object and the and the, the actor or the, you know, just kind of something, something yeah. close to a figure. Um, it's so funny so within, a, within a world where we kind of are kind of in terms of technology and such pushing towards a sense of realism within, you know, trying to make objects and items as realistic as possible and as human mm -hmm. as possible. It's so interesting the way that he kind of defies that back when he was working in, in trying to create Pe make people like objects and trying to yeah, reduce and I mean, them. I think it's I think it's in the context in of you know when he was working in his own personal Absolutely. kind of experiences and trauma. I mean, it's hard not to. I mean, I feel like it, how do you like how do you talk about trauma? How do you? Yeah. Um, it's you know you know when you think about psychoanalysis, it's, you know, talk about how difficult it is to confront trauma, and it's almost like he can't talk about it. It's like the written word almost becomes irrelevant and the object in his work, this is just my interpretation, almost becomes like a mediator for, um, for this kind of being able to talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just feeding in Nina, uh, if we can go through real quick. Yeah, um, I, I just want to quote uh, Brunella Ule, um, who was a persistent presence during Cantor's work with us at the Institute. At the time, she followed his work for 10 years and subsequently continuing the discourse until her untimely death in 2012. And her following assertion reminds us of where Cantor's art came from. She says the experience of the concentration camps and the loss of trust in human reason erases the hierarchies between man and objects and destroys that privileged status accorded to the idea of humanity. So, you know, trauma and then Cantor's um, take on the object and the actor, I think it's just a, it's a, it's just a, 
a continuum. Absolutely. Yeah, I can imagine, I can understand him calling people, interpreting his work or trying to emulate it for being parasites because in a sense it's him expre expressing his own trauma and his own processing of this grief. And so kind of anyone who kind of tries to piggyback off of that or emulate it is almost disingenuous in a sense, would you say? Or kind of... Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of academia now which you know, has come up with, you know, amazing theories around Cantor's work, but he was so central. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, DeMarco says Cantor didn't die. You know, he wasn't killed. But he is, he was so integral to the work that um, I think it's a fallacy, really, to try and uh, recreate that I mean, when he died, uh, Krikod too really imploded because it needed his presence, mm -hmm. and um, I certainly experienced his presence during our work with him yeah. in Charlotte. Yeah. yeah, I think well I, now quickly. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go for it. Sam. I, I just wanted to say also, I think like there's also an element of humour in his work. That's what mm. I get from it as well. Um, obviously, the very dark humour, <laughs> um, <laughs> but there is like a gallows humor for me to his work as well yeah. which is you know obviously it's just also an element i wanted to, to yeah. sort of pick up on as well yeah like absolutely in Be like in beckett's work as well if you yeah. want to parallel and feel free to keep talking about it as we play the clips if you'd like right well this is the um death the the love and death machine and it was created in 1987, so this was a year before he came to Charleville. Ascoltami, tendaci, ti dirò quello che so. I might just ask in the in-between for uh, being able to watch some of Cantor's work at home or in person at any particular theatre. Do you both have any recommendations or where you might be, we might be able to see these clips or see productions? I mean, you can see the Dead Class on YouTube. I mean, the whole thing's on YouTube and it's got English subtitles as well. So, I mean, that's quite a good place to start. Because of Regina. We don't have the <laughs> no, not for this one. <laughs> but uh, I might just pop ahead to for this one. This poor, poor guy. Yeah, so I think I remember being told that if we can just watch it. So that's Cantor himself. Is that right, Nina? Yeah, yeah. On the right. So you, you were talking earlier, Nina, about your experience of working with him as well, weren't you? Yes, this is quite a good example of how he would work with us. But I also think it's a fantastic piece of puppet object theatre. How, how much do you think, you know, someone who worked with him, how much do you think, you know, because clearly this guy is, if you watch it on, he's, he's visibly, you know, shaking. You know, how much is that part of the performance? Um, well, that wasn't a performance, that was a rehearsal. And sure. Cantor was trying to encourage the actor to allow the wrapping to unwrap the box. So he was, he was giving the focus to the object and giving the energy to the object rather than the actor putting themselves onto the object. And that's what I've learned through all my work, really, with puppets, is that you don't make them move. You allow them to do the moving. And I just think that's such a beautiful piece of um, object theater, in that the, the box and the paper, Cantor was trying to allow 
that to speak rather than the actor impose themselves onto that. It's a bit, I mean, we've cut the film right down to a minute. It's eight minutes long. So, um, you know, if you're interested, then uh, search that one out. Yeah, I think uh, what, touching off what Sam said in terms of, because Cantor almost like would, wouldn't allow almost people to do it themselves. He would instruct them um, how he no, would want No, 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 no. He would watch and he would really, really look when you uh, present, you, you, you didn't rehearse, you presented the story on, you know, yourself on stage. And he would really, really look and he would pull out from you what he saw within you. Mm -hmm. And that's what he would use. He would use your material to create the work. So, so mainly fear though, in this case. Sorry? There's a lot of fear going on in that guy, I think. Yes, I think, um, <laughs> when he i've never experienced anybody uh quite behave so badly i mean he's well known for his his temper and and um and i think it could be classed as bullying i think there that you know but um yeah i mean i can remember we were we were in the studio and um the women um had to look through a window um, at the actor who was playing the poet, who was terribly depressed. And Cantor asked us as women to go to the window and offer ourselves to the poet. I didn't last very long, because I just gave such a look of disdain that I was kind of, um, <laughs> you know. No, but, but the other um, actors, and they were trying to do it, and Cantor was so insistent how he wanted that look to be that the, they, they were giggling behind, but not out of laughter, but out of fear. So there was a really unpleasant edge mm. to the work. He's the only person, adult person I've seen lose their rag so much that he, both feet left the floor. <laughs> <laughs> wow, well, there you go. <laughs> uh, but but the, he, he also had that humour. He did have an, an amazing humour. He had a, an amazing caring about his performers. And, and um, I went to the Institute and he was supposed to be painting the set. Mm -hmm. And um, I went in, where's Cantor? You know, and oh, he's, he's gone off. He threw the paints down. They weren't good paints. He's gone off. He's in the cafe. And... <laughs> And so I, I went, and, and I don't speak, I only speak English. Cantor spoke French and Polish. So he was in the cafe, and I just went up to him, and in the character that I was in his piece, the censor, I just smacked him. And he kind of went, <laughs> and I just went, paint! And he looked absolutely shocked, and then he just burst into laughter. And he went, and he went and got on with the painting. <laughs> so. Brilliant, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think that kind of almost leads us on, actually, in a, in a nice way to, to kind of discussions about um, how I think we have got, we've got some images here, Sam, of your work. Um, can you speak a bit more about how, um, because we were talking about you're talking about being the censor there, and we'll we'll touch back back onto that in a second. But um, for Sam, like talking about that level of censorship that was undergone by um, by Cantor, and also the way that yeah. those different elements of his work have influenced your own. Yes, I mean we touched on the sort of I you know talked a little we both talked a little bit about. Uh, I guess I was particularly focused on on how he would there was a meeting of the sort of like figure how he worked with objects in a really um, particular way. Um, so this is a work I made um, in the last five years, and it's called Nesting, Watering, Picturing. And it's an example of the way I work with, um, you know, combining this kind of figurative imagery in the sculptures with sort of more, you know, with the objects. So. Um, so in this particular piece, I was sort of really thinking about how um, this kind of 
concept of work and sort of ubiquity of work as um, this kind of very sort of um, ubiquitous kind of thing in my life and what I was seeing around me at the time. Um, and I, I, I kind of used the different objects which are almost like kind of helmets or, or masks. Um, um, and I was thinking about there being a particular kind of symbolism to each of these. So you have this kind of birdhouse, which is the nesting sculpture. Watering is this kind of watering can which kind of punctured this um, cyclops-like kind of eye <laughs> hole in. And uh, the, you can't really see it so much on this slide, but the third one is called Picturing. And I was really thinking about the work that kind of goes into creating this sense of self-image and sort of project the work that goes into sort of projecting that as well, and thinking about things like social media. So I'm really, um, I guess I'm repurposing some of the way that you know Cantor has pioneered this kind of approach to object theatre and I'm kind of repurposing it to try and talk about these kind of I guess entanglements of you know the mind and body of the individual um, and these the way that that kind of interacts with these particular kinds of sort mm. of I particularly pre prevalent kind of social ideas structures these kind of non non human phenomena yeah yeah absolutely in a sort of theatricalized way I just wanted to mention one more thing, which is just that that is kind of that symbolism is also um, unpacked in the way in the sort of voiceover. So there's a voiceover for each uh, sculpture, so it's almost like that's synchronized with spotlight, um, which sort of creates this quite simple illusion that they're yeah. talking. <laughs> No, oh, wonderful. I think, um, you know, Nina, if you'd like to quickly reflect upon that as well, we've got some images here of you portraying the character, hardly changed seem seemingly as yes. well. Just over there playing the censor, so, I believe you right. said. So, it, so we jump to the censor question. Or like how, how, did, um, how did Cantor influence your work more directly? How has his work impacted your own? Oh gosh. Well, I mean, all my creative life, really, he's been an echo. Um, I was really particularly interested in his concept of the umbrella-like space. And um, I think the previous slide shows a piece of work I did called Conversation with an Umbrella. I rather like the idea of being stuck in a room with a load of umbrellas for three days. Um, and I brought in a sound artist, a terrific um, artist called Kath Matthews. And together we improvised this piece of work. Um, mm -hmm. It was presented as part of um, an international puppet festival. It was quite challenging for the audience because during the process of making it, um, I left the studio um, and went for lunch and when I came back I just saw all the broken umbrellas and discarded umbrellas on the floor and I thought that is so beautiful it doesn't need me and um, and Kath had this amazing sound of the storm and so we decided that um, halfway through the performance I would leave the stage and just leave it blank with mm -hmm. the with the umbrellas so the audience really had time to look and um, the storm I think the first time we did it it was 12 minutes yeah <laughs> I think some people wanted to kill me yeah, <laughs> and on the subject of time, we might actually have to. <laughs> I'm going to have to cut. Enough <laughs> of this bourgeois <laughs> shit! Um. Enough of... We've had enough of the art from the Western gutters. Art is for the masses. I demand we stop this event! Those were the words that Cantor gave me to speak as the censor. And um, <laughs> I was going to say, it's going to be very, it would going to be very hard to lead into a Q&A from that. Well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, well, he had the meeting. You know, with it, you did you did leave it off there in a very good way, but I will actually. <laughs> I might have to give a couple of questions to the audience at least to give them some sort of a say in that. If we are going to give a say to the masses in this point, <laughs> um, so just a couple of questions because I know we're running running out of time. Um, any arms going to shoot up? No, you're all satiated, entertained. That's all you need. They're probably just scared. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you might shout at them. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Okay, well, I mean, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. And another hand to our artists, please.
Okay, so I'm, I'm going to keep this. Feel free to sit yourself down. Yes. Feel free to sit here or pop outside. I might go to the toilet very quick. Go to the toilet. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna go back and then we'll come back. Yeah, but well, feel free to leave these things here. I'm definitely gonna leave these guys. Yeah.
I have another one if you'd like. I do need to read from... No, I don't have yours. But I have an extra one, actually, I think. If you'd like. God, you guys went so instinctively quiet. That was so. That was so good. We like didn't have to like silence you like the previous talks. <laughs> um, anyway, so welcome, guys. Welcome to the. Uh, this is we're talking about uh, Abakanovich, of course. Tate Lates, Abakanovich, final talk of the night. Um, so thank you for joining us. Thank you for deciding to put your time towards uh, this discussion, talking about Abakanovich in the contemporary and how um, her work has influenced contemporary artists and uh, and people within the art world. Um, so, I'm not Anna, uh, as you can maybe tell. Um, unfortunately, the uh, curator who is going to be facilitating this talk has had a personal emergency. Um, so, I'm, my name is Sammy, I'm with the Tate Lakes team and I'm just filling in for that to help facilitate this conversation between uh, our lovely creatives that we have here. Um, so, to introduce them both, we have uh, Tosha Leniarska. We're off to a great start. <laughs> uh, so, Tosha is a curator, writer, and researcher based in London. Recent projects included programming uh, the Chem School, an alter institutional program of critical practice and expanded choreography based in Warsaw. Uh, Paradnik, a Polish grassroots political education and translation project. And she has been featured in the exhibition Scrolling the System at Zaheta, a national, uh, Zaheta National Gallery of Art in Warsaw and in publications including AQNB, Buffalo, Another Magazine, and ID. The group exhibition she has curated at M. Allen in London is on view for one more week, so make your way there. We also have uh, Wojciech Ruszyn, uh, the other paper. <laughs> uh, Wojciech is, a, is an audiovisual artist. He released Siphon LP on AD93 and The Funnel on Akash uh, Akashic Records. Uh, Wojciech uh, draws inspiration from alchemical and Gnostic te texts and early Renaissance choral music. He designs and makes 3D printed reed instruments that you can see here. Um, and Rushin grew up in uh, Zesho. Yeah, <laughs> Zesho in southern eastern Poland uh, and moved to the UK in around 2004 uh, after he visited Bristol and basically never went back home. <laughs> so, um, you know, to kick us off with you both, um, Vakanovich, so uh, one of the things that kind of have been brought across is that Vakanovich is a lot of, her works are huge. They're really, really big, but she kind of has developed them within relatively small studio spaces and didn't necessarily be able to, wasn't able to see what the final works were going to be, how they would be experienced or how they would be um, 
uh, taken on by viewers until being able to place them into larger in exhibition environments. So installing her works kind of was when she was able to kind of draw them into their final shape. Um, so what I would kind of want to touch upon, Tosha, is your more recent curation focuses have been taking in choreography as a method for mapping the body in space, artists and exhibition, and address structures of measurement, norm uh, normativity, and of affect. Um, how do you approach the arrangement of your exhibitions? Would you say it feels more tangible with new technologies not available in Abakamovich's Aba uh, time? Yeah, so uh, this is a picture from the exhibition that's on at Emelin right now. Um, and that I've curated and the, the kind of large assemblage of, of found objects that you see there is by two artists, um, Gretchen Lawrence and Kuma Samba. And um, I think curation always begins with, with the artists themselves. So this example is actually an installation that the artists also assembled in the context of the exhibition, in the context of the space. Um, and so I think in terms of Abakanovich's uh, kind of context is that she was part of a, a pioneering generation of artists who were, who kind of started thinking about exhibitions in terms of um, a kind of uh, an experience in space and, and using their works as methods for guiding you through space as well as uh, thinking of the experience of the viewer um, and in terms of their works as creating affect and actually creating these kinds of um, sort of guided user experiences through the exhibitions. Um, and that was, it, it was a generation of artists kind of like in, in, in the 60s in the, in the kind of modernist context which were in general there was kind of the, the context of architecture and um, and space and um, and the kind of the design of, of spatial experiences became more prominent in in art and that stayed around so that kind of that generate that influence of that generation of artists um, kind of lasted on now until um, in in terms of the the way that artists approach creating exhibitions and I think also another connection between that and Abakanovich is that the um, Gretchen, who is one of the artists who created this installation, was um, is from Estonia. So this kind of this context, it's also thinking about the um, the sort of the periphery and the center and the way that found objects and found materials are uh, are approached and kind of travel between the, these notions, the kind of geographical, geopolitical notions of of the center and the periphery. Um, and the way that Abakanovich, for example, she was using found materials and kind of working with the context, with the restrictions that she met, um, also in, in the context of the, uh, the kind of restrictive government under which she was creating, that was sort of imposing um, specific kind of desired notions of what art could or couldn't be, or like what types of materials were desired for artists to be using. Uh, she kind of was able to sort of rig that system and, and make work that was relevant in the international context. Um, and in terms of this work, it's also, um, yeah, it's thinking about the kind of, the flux of objects and materials between cultures and, uh, and that relationship between the center and the periphery. Yeah, just looking at it, it I mean, honestly, just because it, within the way that I view art, I love dissecting pieces apart. And it was so interesting for you to say about like the inter international aspect to this work. It's just fascinating being able to pick apart all of these little pieces. Um, yeah, and also just, yeah, feeding that off Wojciech actually perfectly in a, in a way. Um, in terms of like thinking about space and the way that um, her work was limited by by that, in, you know, if we're talking about the same sort, almost the same sort of question back to you actually, is that, you know, in, in modern times, how do you feel that that feel has changed the way in terms of, for example, with music, you know, in, in that period, things would have been much more difficult in terms of like, uh, or being with sound art and such. Um, well, I, I guess you can uh, create sort of immediate results, these days. I mean, I, what do you mean by, uh, sorry, I, I don't think I quite got the question in, in the context of um, 
Do, do you mean her, her methods, how, how they are similar to... So, for example, if you were to take a similar sort of analogy of, say, someone who's working and producing in their bedroom at home or inside of their studio space, taking that same sound art installation and then bringing it out into a wider space, that's something that you would need to attune for and change within the space itself before it can be fully appreciated and experienced. In a similar way, Abakanovich, yeah. her work was done yeah. in a very small studio yeah, and then yeah, she sure. didn't get to finalize that work until she brought it out into a wider space. And of course, in a similar manner, in terms of material processes and curator curating the spaces in which you're able to present the work, of course, th those have changed massively. Um, you know, so yeah, I guess you can uh, imagine the work being you know, presented in a bigger space, but also well, it, 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 it kind of really depends. I mean, you know, you can, uh, sometimes it's really necessary to do rehearsals in and kind of feeling the architecture of, 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 the, of the performance where it's, where it's, where it's uh, happening. So, uh, but obviously some other things can be imagined and kind of uh, appropriated in, in the kind of studio space where, uh, where, where you can, where, where smaller work, where work which is, basically designed or, or, or created in, in, in a studio can then be reimagined in a larger space. I mean, if this yeah. is your question. No, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, in a way it kind of like feeds us on to the, to the next question I have for you, actually, for you actually, which is similarly to her work, you know, um, you kind of create modern objects, but inspired by archaic technology and materials. Uh, sorry, she had, but in yeah, a sense yeah. you kind of almost flipped that in a way yourself well yeah I mean she's sort of using kind of uh, uh, yeah ancient kind of technologies she's kind of pulling things from from you know the um, the past and uh, and she's mixing it with new materials as well in a way um, I, I think uh, there is a always a thrill to to reach to the ancient, you know, technologies, like, I don't know, with those 3D printed instruments, for example, I was using this reed, which uh, has been described by Homer as this kind of Dionysian element, which is sort of chaotic and comes from, from the body and from the lungs and mm. um, quite unpredictable. And, you know, that stuff was, um, you know, documented, you know, this kind of instruments are in the Louvre in, Fra in uh, Paris, you know, uh, they had a, uh, this Aulos uh, instrument like about 500 years uh, before Christ where they can kind of, uh, you know, have it and then there's a lot of people who are recreating this sound and there's a genuine kind of interest in that because there's some kind of archetypal sound coming, coming from the past and, you know, and people trying to do something with this. So, you know, you would have people who are um, artists who are sort of recreating this instrument, but also like I'm, I'm kind of, um, you know, for me the interesting thing is to kind of pull this from the past and somehow install this into this kind of new technology and reimagine some kind of time. And there's some kind of weird intermingling of, of the past and the future going on because you, you know, you're kind of like reimagining inst an instrument from the future or maybe from the past through the, you know, you're imagining the past through the future but also, ups, you know, the other way around yeah. in a way. And, um, well, I don't, I don't know, I mean, that's, it's is hard that to say why this is interesting but, yeah. you know, it's, <laughs> it's kind of... Uh, is that one of the ways in which you kind of connect with conceptually with her work in particular? Well, yeah, I, th I, th I think there is, uh, you know, there's the, the kind of the, the, the you know, the, the, the interest in antiquity. It's kind of weird because, you know, like, obviously there are a lot of regimes which were also obsessed with antiquity and, you know, the Nazis were obsessed with some beautiful ruins and then, and, uh, you know, I don't know, there are probably some other examples with, you know, the kind of objective classicist kind of... Uh, uh, proportions, for example, or something which is kind of like, you know, pre-modern, that somehow this implies some kind of quality that we lost for, in kind of post-modern paradigm, maybe. So, you know, I think, you know, I, think, I, I, I don't know, there's just so many angles to this that it's really hard to, to say why, why that is, uh, you know, relevant. 
But you know, with her work, yeah, I mean, she is taking something very uh, kind of, yeah, ar archaic or ancient and blowing it into this kind of abstraction, which is a very modern language. It's a very yeah. kind of contemporary language. Yeah, and I think kind of, if we want to feed that back over to you, Tosha, talking about contemporary ways of speaking and contemporary ways of seeing, if we're talking about that in her contemporary as well, um, you know, talking post-Stalin, so, uh, post-Stalinist uh, Eastern Europe and uh, and and Poland. If we're talking about in the in the in the framing that uh, we have censorship and the way that censorship played a particular role within art uh, in that period, and then uh, even though there was not necessarily not necessarily the fall of uh, of, commu uh, of communism within that period, and that censorship was going to continue in a sense. Um, within the way that her art experienced that shift. Uh, I wanted to ask, because you've been working with uh, several activist projects and br you bring a lot of attention to recent government actions uh, showcasing homophobia, discrimination in the country. Uh, could you talk a bit more about them and the current influence of the Polish government in the, act, uh, the art sector? Um, would you say some forms of art censorship are coming back? Yeah, I think there are very interesting parallels between. Um, yeah, this is this is a good example of a site. So um, yeah, there are interesting parallels between how um, how Abakanovich had to operate under the kind of the state that she was creating, um, under which she was creating art, um, because it was obviously in, in kind of in, in the age of socialist realism as as an art genre that was imposed by the state. They were, as Wojciech was saying, they were kind of, you know, enamored with the classicism, and they were enamored with with representative art and representational art, and um, and there was this kind of. Um, I think it was actually quite groundbreaking for Abakanovich to be an artist who was coming from the kind of the angle of craft and especially tapestry, which was seen as both women's art and folk art, and so she was kind of using the the material which was kind of imposed of her on her by the state and then um kind of overriding their um their imposition and cr making it into something abstract making it into something that was like uh the western art which the state was trying to um to kind of restrict the artist from from referencing and then she was also able to create these connections with um with the international um sort of art community at large and um, and these parallels, I kind of I noticed them with uh, with the way that Polish art institutions are operating now. Where since the the rise of the current right wing government in Poland, they have been actually co opting art institutions, and they have been sort of just this this long process of of firing um, directors and curators of major art institutions and replacing them with um, with right-wing figures and, and just um, party members. And in that way, um, actually, it's, it's extremely limiting for the, for the art world in Poland now, and it gives rise to, um, to sort of grassroots initiatives which try to replace this kind of, um, this lack that, 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 has, that has come into place. And CAM, which is the, um, um, queer performance art group, which I worked with in Poland on an educational pro program called Chem School, they actually were um, were residents in an institution in, called um, the Center for Contemporary Art in Warsaw, back when it wasn't kind of co-opted by the right wing government yet, and they created this kind of um, queer takeover of it. This is a picture from it where they, during the residency, they actually introduced a queer drag bar, which was pretty much the only queer nightlife space in Warsaw at the time. And they opened it once a month in the kind of backside of the institution when they built this temporary staircase to enter it. And actually the staff in the bar were, uh, the bartenders were the curators of the, um, of the institution. And they kind of created this complete kind of um, queer takeover of space when the when the actual public space was kind of denying this, but um, that very institution now is completely cut. All of these, like all the curators uh, who weren't fired, left, and these and the same artists now have to set up alter institutions, so their own kind of grassroots alternatives to um, to 
you to kind of this to the slack. So what kind of levels of censorship and suppression are those in the new grassroots institutions? Or what, what sort of things are they experiencing now? Is in there? Um, I think it's, it's not only, it's kind of more, even more multi-level than a question of censorship because it's actually mm -hmm. a, a question of, of sort of, of platforming and what sorts of programming does, is given a voice to. So instead, that, that very institution, which was able to put in this kind of very queer program that was actually, you know, had, had a massive influence on, on the community, actually built space, which was, uh, which was truly changing for, um, um, for the community there, now is hosting, like, actual fascist events of, um, of yeah, bands, bands playing, like, nationalist rock music. It's really mostly just embarrassing. Mm. <laughs> what sort of time frame has that happened? Because that's fairly quick change. Um, so the last uh, progressive curator has left that institution, I think, within the past two years. That takeover has been happening. Um, but it's been gradual, so the, the right-wing government has stepped in in 2015, mm -hmm. and since then they have been kind of gradually um, replacing all institutions in Poland, so both art institutions, but also um, um, legal institutions like the like the Tribunal, uh, Supreme Court. Um, it's it's been sort of like an um, across all levels of, of both culture and um, and legal power. Uh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. So I've just got a few more images then. Oh yeah, that's like the, that's that's the same please. institution. Um, so that was, so a moment ago we were looking at the back door entrance to it. Exactly. But yeah. this is the front. Yeah. Wow. And this is an article written by another curator of another institution in Poland who, um, um, yeah, who kind of described the same populist process. Um, I think I think that question of populism is also very interesting because it is um, the populist right instead of the kind of progressive. Um, uh, progressive kind of liberal um, governments. It's mm. a difference in. Is this the inside then of the same building, or? Yes. Well. Wow. So. <laughs> so I might I might feed back onto you again actually for this um, in terms of uh, Abakana, which is sort of like the the a lot of the core elements of a lot of her work in terms of the feminist art movement and her inclusion, various international exhibitions from WAC Art and the Feminist Revolution 2007 to MOCA Los Angeles was a result of certain feminist aspects detected in her Abakan works. Its suggestive, its suggestive body uh, form was recently connected to the Poland's abortion ban protests, which has been occurring around the country and beyond in the recent years. Uh, Tosha, you've been also active across various grassroots political education pro platforms and initiatives, including Living a Feminist Life, a uh, four-day conference and picnic, support, uh, inspired by Sarah Ahmed's work, uh, book of the same title. Um, could you tell us what the main objectives of these initiatives in Poland are, and have the recent events made both Polish feminist and queer voices louder and more determined? Um. Yeah, absolutely. So that uh, that program, I think Sarah Ahmed is also a good um, a good kind of writer to to refer to as her feminism is um, intersectional and also thinks about the kind of um, the position of the of the queer community in Poland as well as women who, um, in terms of the, yeah, like the government, it's part of that populist movement has also been to um, to limit access to sexual health care and. Um, and to abortions, which which um, kind of sparked these massive, massive protests, um, which um, have not had an effect. So the government kind of remains in power because of the kind of this like strategic removal of the um, of, of democratic power with with the replacement of of, of um, the Supreme Court with um, party members, government gov kind of government cronies. Um, and yeah, I think, I mean, maybe, maybe a good thing to kind of wind it together with, with uh, Abakanovich's art is this kind of visceral anger that accompanies all of these movements in terms of, um, and also something that, that is not easily represented in, in the kind of art and the kind of 
classicizing art um, enforced by populist governments, that is something that maybe can be best expressed in um, in abstract art and in, for example, in the Bakanovich's art, is this kind of um, visceral um, protest and um, and anger that accompanies these these situations. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, yeah. Sorry, feeding that off to you, Voice. <laughs> if you want to reflect upon that, uh, similar ideas or that's. That was very well said. I don't know if I can, you know, it's just kind of a sad thing to hear it, you know, going to Poland and like just kind of, we had this conversation before we had this talk about a certain change because when, I don't know when you were leaving Poland, but when I was leaving Poland in 2004, there was a much more of a liberal climate, I think. And, and now like, you know, you would assume that it would go into a kind of uh, more liberal direction, but it went the other direction. So, so you know. So then, yeah, yeah. I mean, she's yeah, she's she's, she's very relevant um, because you have basically yeah, you have two kind of ways of um, two kind of tensions. You know, yeah. the communist kind of. Uh, Do you feel like you own. have a sense of almost? A feeling, or even a sense, maybe even a sense of responsibility, to using your artwork and such, and your influences, to being able to reflect upon that and kind of. Well, I think you know you're always. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's 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 really. Uh, I think as, as as an artist, you, you're always. You, there's no escape from from kind of heritage, you know, or 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 you're kind of focused, you know. I, I've been living in in the UK for like, like last last twenty twenty years or something, but it's always something which makes me reflect on what what's going on there, and you know, and also just the situation of like being a Polish artist here in in in, Lo in London. So you know, when I was when I was studying at Goldsmiths, um, my sonic arts degrees, and I sort of in, in you know imagined these uh, instruments and, and started kind of uh, 3D printing these things, um, you know, and, and I, th I think I was talking to my, to my tutor saying like, look, I'm, I'm just going to propose this as sort of this traditional Polish instruments, this kind of Carpathian instruments to, to kind of somehow reimagine my heritage, you know, and, and, and you know, so, and you know, and there are certain questions like, you know, then appear what, what, what that means for me or what that means for, for the kind of Anglo-Saxon Western kind of gaze, and how they kind of look at this, uh, you know, just it's also about kind of like pulling the the periphery into the center and through creating a fiction, you know, actually uh, m making something in in focus, you know, uh, by by that by that fiction, you know. So you know, so if it's if it's sound, and then you know that invites the, the the process of making instruments kind of then invites you to to make music and 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 this kind of imaginary musics and and, all, and yeah, I don't know, you know it's all kind of interconnected somehow, you know, but it's it's also you know, kind of that political aspect is not there kind of obviously, but it's kind of lingers somewhere where. There is a context. There's a political context to everything, you know, and even in ab ab abstraction, there is a, you know, very strong political context. I think. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm going to start expanding this out onto the floor in terms of Q and A's. Um, we've just got a few minutes left, so you know, if we've got any particular questions, who want to, you know, expand in onto that <laughs> questions of abstraction. Um, yeah, go for it. Uh, we've got a mic for you just on the side there. Wow. Okay. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, so uh, just very interested in continuing that conversation going. I mean, the short question is, how do you deal with no platforming in both Poland and as a Polish artist in the UK? Uh, but the longer question, I guess, is um, reflecting on Abakanovich's work and uh, the context in which they were producing work and the context in which you guys are producing work is it something that you are like actively engaging with in um how you not only how you produce the artwork that you produce but how you um put it out there and how you talk about it uh, you both kind of like touched upon it in terms of uh how it's like tangentially related to your works uh, but I'm just kind of interested in like 
what is it that a UK audience is not seeing um, from, uh, yeah, from your work? Uh, I think, okay, this is turning into a rambling question, but <laughs> um, basically I think that UK audience is kind of like uh, not necessarily understanding the populism that is going on in Poland and how that is actually impacting the work of many, many artists in Poland. And you guys as Polish artists in the UK have like a position where you're able to kind of... Uh, show that to people? Is it something that you think that you engage with and how? Sorry, I just got... Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know really. I mean, uh, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a question. Or if, uh, <laughs> it's, um, I, it's hard to compare your, your practice when you're living in London to her practice. You know, that's, that's a kind of, uh, I think, I think she, she, you know, like Abakanovich work, like kind of this kind of territory is very harder, much harder to navigate. I think if you have the communist regime and you're proposing something which is sort of traditional, no, but like, but then blowing it to an extreme of some abstraction and and anger and what you said, you know, about, but sort of working in the in the frame of you know a folk art or or you know um, almost. But, uh, well, I, I, I don't know, I, I don't really think, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if I remember your question very well, but like, <laughs> it's... it's uh, Basically, this is the uh, new form of censorship, uh, the new form, the new context for which art production is taking place. So, uh, what is it about your works that is engaging with it and kind of dealing with the fact that you're being no-platformed by the current <coughs> government? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, no. Tosha, do you want to jump in? <laughs> <laughs> Temporarily. Um, um, yeah, I think. Um, um, do you feel almost like this sub, uh, you know, like a category of, not subcategory, not at all, no, um, but a category it. of Polish artists as Polish artists in London? through the effects of the kind of rise of this populist government? I, mean, I think, well, we are just in an extremely comfortable position being in the West. And I think that's the main thing where it's not, um, it's in in any kind of a system here, it, it's a, a lot of artwork is work of subversion of the restrictions and kind of impositions that, that you're working with. And these are going to be different as um, as an immigrant in um, in a Western country, or maybe um, maybe dealing with um, with the kind of like um, stereotypes about um, about the kind of work you'd be making. And but at the same time, it's um, very often it's kind of easier. And I I think that with um, I mean actually the thing in the UK that's interesting is that it's been spiraling down so badly recently in terms of the like political state of, of this country that it's almost been similar and so I'm like sometimes you find yourself in solidarity in a similar way with yeah. for example trans people in the UK as they do in Poland so it's these things actually are more interconnected and, and similar than, than one would think. Yeah do you feel like your position as a curator almost works at, you know maybe feeding off of this question you know, do you feel like the, the work that you choose to present and show, particularly to British audiences living in London, it's almost like a, a word of warning or, a, a, you know, a, a kind of warning for precursor of what, what is happening in other parts of the world and what is kind of, in a sense, on the rise in the UK itself? I don't, I don't think of it as, as a warning, but it's the same type of um, trying to um, just kind of engender a type of sensitivity to... Um, to everybody's conditions and in, in, in kind of in any context in these um, and people in the UK should rather than um, sometimes it's not really about looking towards what um, like how dark the situation is is elsewhere but also to kind of um, keep keep kind of keep your own government account accountable as well and, and kind of keep the attention of like um, you know other countries which were very liberal before it's it, it can get worse and um, without pressure on the government it, it does so. absolutely do you want to quickly touch upon that well I, I think it's minutes. just you sort of I think you're 
we are navigating this kind of double realities here because you know you have the kind of focus on Poland but also like you're living somewhere else and you're you're dealing with also like what does it mean to be uh, an Eastern European artist in, Pol in, in Britain I think and then you can that also uh, that's a very also a complex kind of set of conditions uh, which in, in, inform your work so oh, I don't know really what, what, the, what the answer is but like you know it's uh, it's quite complex, you know. You can, I, I guess just be, being an immigrant, I think, uh, or, or be, being sort of outside, you can kind of maybe have a little bit of a distance to to both of the cultures, where you're kind of occupying this strange space where you're not really at home, uh, you not really feel that, that connected with your kind of, you know, with, with Poland because you left, and, and you're not really, you know, I, I cannot vote, I haven't got a British citizenship, so you're still kind of like slightly... Yeah. Uh, and then after Brexit, of, of course, that you're feeling more European and then you're trying to ask yourself what that means and, you know... Your identity I, I lives somehow, in the liminality of that yeah. ambiguous space between... I, yeah, and I think it, it reflects in the, in, the, in the work, I think, you know. I think if, if, I, if, if I lived in Poland, I think may, maybe my work would have much more a direct anti-establishment edge, for example. But 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 because we're operating from here and, and and there's obviously less tensions, I think for me personally, you know, I, I feel you know very bad for for people in in Poland. Sometimes they have to you know struggle for 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 you know stuff that the West was was dealing with you know years ago. So so you know. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. Unfortunately, we might have to leave it on that note. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Big hand for our. Quite lovely speakers. Thank you very much for coming to Abakanovich's uh, themed Tate Late. I hope you had a lovely night. Uh, Tate Late is ending now, so if you can all file yourselves out through that back door and make your way down. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.